us at the Morton Arboretum for tonight's program. We have a really great evening in store for, uh, in store for you tonight. Before we begin, I wanted to thank our co-sponsors, uh, C2ST, that is the Chicago Council for Science and Technology. They're a nonprofit organization that seeks to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology and their impact on society. You can visit c2st.org for more information about their upcoming programs. And they also have an extensive YouTube channel with their previous programs, and you can check all those out for free. Uh, so they're live streaming tonight, so say hello. Um, <laughs> And this uh, program will also be available after the program on their YouTube channel as well as the Arboretum's YouTube channel. I also wanted to give a special thank you to Susan Ask from the Animalia Project who helped put this program together this evening. And if you want some great cli uh, climate change resources, you can visit animaliaproject.org slash climate. So tonight you're gonna be hearing from a really impressive panel of experts. And you're gonna have a chance to ask them your questions as well. You'll see out on the tables and chairs, there are some forms that you can fill out. You can add your questions to those forms. And we have some wonderful volunteer facilitators who will be circulating the room, collecting your questions for you. And they will take care of passing those on to our moderator this evening. We aren't gonna get to every question, but we will do the best that we can. The bar is gonna be open all night, so feel free to get up at any time. Help yourself to another drink. <laughs> We're here to have fun. This is a serious topic. <laughs> Not you, Jerome. <laughs> so let's, let's have some fun. Let's learn some stuff. And let's go home armed with some tools that we can use uh, to make a difference in the world. Uh, if you could make sure that your cell phones are silenced, that would be great. But we do encourage you to take pictures, post on social media, and tweet using the hashtag Future of Trees. Now with that, I'd like to introduce the Vice President of Science and Conservation here at the Morton Arboretum, Dr. Nicole Cavender. She has a brief welcome message on behalf of the Arboretum. And thank you, Brooke, for all that you've done to pull this together. And I'm so pleased to welcome you here tonight at the Morton Arboretum. Um, I think it's gonna be a really enlightening and inspiring evening tonight on a great topic conversation around our future of trees and a changing climate and really a changing world. Take a look at this slide over here. There's a lot changing in the world. We've got the average temperature changing at a really rapid pace. You'll see the time frame there. It's happening very rapidly. We have an increase in carbon dioxide, an increase in, in population growth an increase in deforestation. We've really had an impact on this earth, haven't we? But here at the Morton Arboretum, well, we focus on trees, and our mission is really about the study, the conservation, the planting of trees. So naturally, in the context of climate change, in the context of a changing world, well, we think about trees, and we ask ourselves, well, what about the trees? What's gonna happen to the trees in this changing world? And most importantly, what can we do about it? What can we do to make sure that we sustain trees for our future? Because we know that trees are valuable and we know they're really important. Because it impacts everyone. The quality of our environment impacts everyone. And it is the existing trees that are delivering those immediate benefits. And let me illustrate this with a statistic I just read in the Journal of Forestry. In the US alone, the urban trees in the US are delivering more than $18 billion in ecosystem services. That's a lot of money, $18 billion. And that includes things like cleaning the air, carbon sequestration, um, energy reduction in energy use. It's a very conservative estimate because it's not even quantifying some of these other benefits that we haven't figured out how to put a dollar value on yet. Like, social cohesion or the benefit to mental health or beautification or wildlife. So it's really important that we think about this topic and it's a critical that we think about trees in relation to climate change because they're very vulnerable. Think about trees, they're long-lived organisms, they're rooted in the ground. They can't just get up and decide to migrate to another area because the climate isn't suitable. 
it takes long-term thinking and planning to really protect them. And so here at the Morton Arboretum, well, we've been studying them for more than 90 years. And we study and evaluate the suitability of, of trees, especially in the upper Midwest. But we also collaborate globally with experts like these to really think about the pertinent questions we need to ask ourselves so that we can better manage them. So we can think about past and how the trees have interacted in past environments and past changing times. And then we can also think about how we might model it in the future. So we can take the most important action steps that are going to have impact for our future. And that's what this is really about tonight. You're going to hear a lot about what we know in this current environment about trees. And you're also going to hear about what we're doing about it and what you can all do about it, because we can all do something. So this is about hope. And we certainly hope that you'll be able to engage in this conversation and you'll be able to take away things that you can use and that you can share with other people. And honestly, I can't think of a better person to help us with this discussion than Jerome McDonald. We are so, so excited to have you here tonight. And uh, since 1994, he's been hosting the Worldview Show, the WBEZ Worldview, and it's a great program. It's a program that explores topics both locally and globally in the environment, in current events. And we're just really excited to have you here, Jerome, and I'm going to hand it to you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm a super fan of the Morton Arboretum, and I'm super fan of all the people who come and support it and engage with this topic. Uh, thank you for caring so much about your natural world and your curiosity about tonight's topic. I'm curious about tonight's topic. That's why I wanted to moderate the panel. And uh, I, you know, I, we hear so many things, and I say so many things in the media about trees and. Uh, climate change, you know, trees are gonna help us mitigate climate change, but trees are also getting wiped out by climate change too. So we'll try to sort some of that out tonight and get a better grip on what's going on. Uh, we've got a great panel to do it. They're gonna have opening statements. We're gonna talk amongst ourselves for a while, then we'll take questions. It'll be pretty simple. There'll be some slides and things, and Don's got some slides, I know. And uh, we're gonna get started right off with the science part of this. Because uh, why not? Uh, we've got a great atmospheric scientist with us tonight. Um, John Wibbles is a professor of uh, atmospheric sciences at the University of Illinois. From 2015 to 2017, he was assistant director with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the Executive Office of the President in Washington, D.C. He um, helps guide national and international understanding of climate change and its impact on society and ecosystems. He's co-authored a number of international and national scientific assessments, including those by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment. Don's brought the executive summary. We got a pile of them right behind us. And uh, so in addition to his work on urban sustainability, Dr. Wibbles has uh, studied trends in severe weather under a changing climate, the effects of change on food security, and on urban air quality relative to changing climate and emissions. Uh, Don Wibbles, great to meet you, and uh, let it rip. Thank you. Thank you, you're very kind. Um, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of the odd person here because I am a physical scientist, and when I want to know something about um, plants or trees, which is often, I turn to my wife, who is a biologist, and she tells me what they are very patiently. <laughs> um, sometimes not so patiently. But uh, in any case, uh, what I'm going to tell you about tonight is some of the findings from the uh, fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment. We released volume one in um, uh, November of 2017, which means we had to get it approved through the White House by the, by the Trump administration, and, uh, and we did so successfully. Um, and right now we're working on the second volume, and I'm probably, so this is the, uh, the, the first volume, and it, it, as Jerome said, there's um, 
some copies, not, not a lot, but there's a few copies up here of the executive summary. But if you go to the web, uh, science2017.globalchange.gov, you can see the full assessment and all 475 pages of it and just enjoy learning some science. Uh, but what you'll learn about is some of the, a few of the things I'll talk about here. I won't go into sea level rise and some of the other issues. I'll concentrate mostly on the things that, that we think will affect trees. Um, and uh, right now we're also working on the second volume, and that has to do with impacts. And there's chapters on forest and the Midwest um, and uh, all the other parts of the country and the other types of uh, sectors of you know, energy and agriculture and um, transportation, et cetera, that one might be concerned about in that. And that's right now, the, the draft is like 1,500 pages or something like that. It's huge. But um, the idea is to come out of that with a better understanding of how climate change is affecting the American people. And, um, and that's what both of these volumes are aimed at. So what, a, what is the... Uh, the science volume tell us. Our climate is changing. It's not sometime in the future. It's changing right now, and it's affecting us uh, in many different ways. It's extre changing extremely rapidly, about 10 times more rapidly than nature tends to change the Earth's climate system. So it's a really rapid change, and that makes it really difficult for humans and trees and other parts of the ecosystem to adapt to those very rapid changes. Um, and it's affecting things like extreme weather. It's affecting particularly the intensity of extreme weather. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and it's affecting things like sea level rise um, that are going to have significant impacts in our coastal areas. And in fact, already are. I mean, we're having a significant increase in what's called nuisance flooding. When there's a high tide, we're tending to get flooding of streets in many cities already. And that's only getting worse. And it's happening because of human activities. The science has become very clear over the last decade that, um, uh, that it's almost entirely due to, to changes that are uh, happening. You know, concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases in the atmosphere, what we call greenhouse gases, and, and various particles. Now, we do have natural variability as well, but this change is so large that uh, it, it uh, is dominating that. And it's not the sun. The sun has not changed in its emissions uh, over the last 40 years. We've had uh, very, uh, over 30 years, where we've had um, excellent observations from satellites of, of the solar output. And long before that, the sun's been pretty constant for, the last, for, for many thousands of years, actually. And, um, and it's not because of natural cycles. It's, it's happened because of human activities. Um, the uh, final thing I want to comment there is the climate's going to continue to change. We're going to, it's going to change more over the century. And the question is how much really depends on our choices and what emissions we further make. So um, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to focus it on the United States. Globally, we've seen about a 1.8 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Similarly for the U.S. The U.S. averages out just about 1.8 over the last uh, century, since about 1900. And a lot of that change is occurring in places like the Midwest, uh, where you see the really deep red um, there. Uh, there are a few areas, very few areas in the globe that we see a cooling effect. One of those areas actually is southeast United States. And uh, that uh, we think may be related to the deforestation that happened in the 19th century and the reforestation that happened in the 20th century, um, leading to a cooling effect in, in that region. On the right hand side, we chose the changes of precipitation. Uh, overall, we've seen a, an increase in the amount of uh, uh, precipitation in the U.S. by about 4 percent, not a huge amount, um, but it's the, the precipitation is getting redistributed. We're seeing a further drying um, of the southeast and southwest that would be expected from the basic physics. A warmer atmosphere, by the way, holds more water vapor. We should expect an increase in precipitation. That's particularly being seen in extreme precipitation, and I'll show you that in a second. 
But in the Midwest, it's one of those areas where we've seen an overall increase in precipitation. In fact, it's kind of keeping this area from being even warmer than it would be otherwise. Um, I mentioned extremes. Well, one of the ways we know that extreme events are really increasing is because of the uh, number of what's called billion dollar events that we see in the United States. That's resulted over the last 37 years, these are analyzed by NOAA, by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. That's cost the American people about $1.5 trillion over the last uh, 37 years um, because of effects of extreme events on infrastructure. Um, and we've seen an increase in, in such events, even accounting for inflation and, and so forth, of um, having several such events per, per year to now having more like 14, 15, 16, like we, this last year we had 16 such events. Uh, and we've already had three such events uh, uh, through March of this year. Um, if we're looking at um, the number of extreme weather, or extreme uh, warm days, the, the days that set records, we're seeing many more of those than we see of cold days. Generally, cold days are decreasing um, on average, but the um, number of warm days are increasing. We're getting more heat waves also. Um, and as I mentioned, more precipitation when it does rain or it snows is more likely to be a larger event. So in the, in the Midwest, we've seen an increase about 40% in such events over uh, the last uh, se almost 70 years. Now, if we look at projections, looking out over this next century, the, the amount of change really depends on our choices we make in terms of future emissions. But if we continue the pathway we have, which is to uh, continue to heavily use fossil fuels, then we can expect to see on the order of 8 to 10 Fahrenheit increase in temperature over the century, um, quite a bit less than that, about half that amount, if we uh, really uh, change our way of dealing with energy and transportation and reduce those emissions. Um, so 8 to 10 degrees, that may not sound like much because we can get that much variation easily in a day, but when you look at the average over the, the planet, or even over something as large as the United States, it's quite significant, particularly when you consider the last ice age was about 15 degrees colder than now. And here we had, you know, whatever, 100, 100 foot or 100 meters of uh, ice over this area. Uh, uh, quite a bit different world. And likewise, uh, we can expect by the end of the century, if we follow that pathway, we're going to see quite a bit different world in terms of heat than we're used to. Um, and there's been even many other ramifications of that that I won't get into. Looking at precipitation, we continue to, in this region, to expect an increase overall in precipitation, particularly in winter and spring, with summer expected to be drying. So we can expect to, um, you know, I'm a farm boy from southern Illinois originally, uh, and uh, I, uh, I worry about what farmers are going to have to face. So when you're trying to get your crops in the field, it's going to be very difficult when you try to uh, then deal with what's happening during the summer. It's going to be hot and dry in the so very dry soils and uh, potentially very significant problems happening with that. So if we look at the number of days above 90 degrees by, by mid-century, we're talking about having um, uh, a month or more uh, such days, uh, likely to be much warmer even over the next few decades uh, than it is now. And if uh, likewise, the number of cold days um, days below freezing are likely to decrease. Um, overall, I think um, a lot of people will like that, but things like fruit trees don't particularly love that. Uh, they like that seasonal change. So what does this mean for trees? Um, as I said, I'm not an expert, but we're going to face more extreme heat, more concerns about precipitation coming as large events when it comes, but all at the same time, more concerns about drought and drier soils, uh, particularly in the summer months. Um, air, and water, air and water quality concerns, a warmer climate tends to lead to more concerns about ozone uh, in, in the production in the atmosphere. Um, the more concerns about insects, pathogens, and diseases with the warmer climate and uh, moving northward of many different uh, um, pests that, that can affect us. And finally, potential changes in wildlife and, and invasive species that can also potentially impact uh, this region greatly. So I'll leave it there and, uh, and we can move on.
I want, I want to ask you a quick question. Oh, you, sure. what, in some of your other presentations, you put up a slide that shows a moving Illinois. Yes. Uh, it, and it's a pretty striking place where it goes beyond the end of the century. It's a great big map of the United States. And, and it moves down to where? So it's called, the, yeah, it's a migrating states diagram. I started about uh, 15 years or so, more than that, almost 20 years ago. And uh, what, what tends to happen, uh, based on our current knowledge of temperature and precipitation changes, uh, and, and looking at those across uh, uh, the country, that Illinois in, ends up in eastern Texas in terms of it, what it's like. So it gets roughly the same that, amount of precipitation the, as now. That's the end of the century. The end of, the, that's the end of the century. It just kind of slides down 25 yeah. years until we're in East Texas. Yeah, and uh, I have a son who lives in Dallas area, and and uh, yeah, when he moved there in the winter time, he thought, oh, it's so much better in Illinois. But I said, just wait. <laughs> May came and every day was above 90 degrees. And, and so. if I could put that together with the, um, the National Climate Assessment, if you whip onto the website, you get, it breaks it down to the Midwest and everything. And the upshot for trees in the Midwest uh, and, the Midwest and the Climate Assessment is um, there's going to be less forests and less ability to uh, be carbon sinks, is, seem to be the, the bottom line of the Climate Assessment. Well, it's, it's very much a concern, yes. All right, we're, that's uh, Don Wibbles. We'll be talking more with him as the, as the evening moves on. And next we're going to hear from uh, Christy Rollinson. She's a forest ecologist here with the Morton Arboretum. And she studies how interactions among climate disturbance, among climate disturbance and community composition influence where trees grow, how they grow, and how well the ecosystem functions overall. The goal of her research is to provide the information and tools necessary to understand and predict how pressures from climate change and human management impact the world around us. Uh, Chrissy, take it over. All right, thank you. Um, so I am the forest ecologist here at the Morton Arboretum. I've only been here for about a year, so I'm still learning some of the ins and outs. If you say neighborhoods in Chicago, you're going to have to tell me north, south, east, west, because I don't know yet. Um, but so at the Arboretum, I'm part of the Center for Tree Science. And so I'm kind of representing our whole group. As the Center for Tree Science, we have scientists that don't just study the trees or just the above ground part, which is what I tend to look at. Uh, we have people that study kind of every aspect of the tree you are interested in. Uh, we have people that study roots. We have people that study soils. Uh, we have an arboriculture scientist. So if you want to know how to cut your tree, go talk to Jake. Um, and so my job um, as a forest ecologist is I'm really the middleman here. I literally take the outputs from the kind of models that Dom was just talking about, and then I do the science of how it impacts trees and forests, and then I hand it off to people like Leslie that then tell you what you should do with it. Um, so my job here is to represent the science of how climate and weather impact trees and how they grow. Um, and so when you're thinking about trees and how they grow, the first thing to keep in mind is that trees grow slowly. Um, a lot of you have on your tables or perhaps in your seats a tree core that we took from here at the Arboretum. Uh, that is not a particularly old tree. Um, a lot of the trees in the Arboretum go back to about 1850. And it's still happy, it's still growing, and it is just literally a random tree in our woods. Um, and so you have to think long term. Whenever you're thinking about trees, you need to think 100 years into the future. And the Arboretum is a really great case for illustrating that because we've been around for almost 100 years. So this is a picture of the hedge garden right that way, uh, taken in the 19, uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. And so when Joy Morton decided to uh, found the Arboretum, he did so knowing that he wasn't going to live to see what we see today. You know, all the, that hedge garden is only about, you know, knee high or so. And so when you're thinking about trees, you have to think about what your children or your grandchildren are going to do. My parents own a lot of forest land out in Virginia. And when they acquired the land, they did some harvesting to improve the, the quality of the forest. And as part of what they were trying to decide, they weren't trying to think about when they would be able to harvest it again to pay for retirement. They were thinking about when my nephew would be able to harvest it to pay for college. And so, you know, over time, the hedge garden and the arboretum has grown into what you see and love today. But that happened very slowly. If we were to have taken a picture every single year, 
you know, from 1922 to 1923, you know, the trees would have gotten a little bit taller. But it didn't happen overnight. So you have to have this long-term planning. Um, and part of that long-term planning is kind of maddening. We don't tend to think 100 years into the future, but trees do. That also makes them very hard to study uh, because I don't think I'm gonna live to be 100. So how do we study these processes and tree lifespans when it's gonna be you know, four or five people in my job that are gonna be studying it? Well, kind of the maddening thing that we often talk about being a challenge of trying to study tree science is actually a really great opportunity. It's what makes trees uniquely suited to understanding how climate has changed in the past. And so because they are long-lived, the oldest trees in the world are you know, 5,000 years old. They go back to when the pyramids were built. And so that means that we're able to use trees and tree rings to look at how climate has changed at these long time scales. Don was talking about climate is changing now 10 times faster than in the past. And one of the key ways we know that is by looking at how trees have grown in the past. Um, Another challenge is that trees are stationary. Nicole talked about, you know, it's not like Lord of the Rings where the Ents migrate and go to war. Um, I hate to burst your bubble, but that's not how it works. The trees have to deal with whatever nature decides to throw at it or whatever we as people throw at it. And so that means that, you know, trees can't migrate to save themselves. But it also means that because they have to grin and bear it, you know, I don't have to go out at two in the morning hoping to find that particular bird. It's always gonna be there. And then kind of the final thing that makes trees really great for studying climate is just kind of like people, and you're never quite sure what is nature versus nurture. We have that same issue with trees. So if the climate might resemble East Texas by the end of the century, how much can we understand uh, how, what the world's gonna be like by studying trees in East Texas? The problem is, even though climate is changing, we're not going to magically get the soils of East Texas. However, we have people like Matt that uh, decide to go to East Texas and grab their trees and plant them here. And so this really helps us separate the influences of climate versus everything else. It helps us figure out you know, how much of your personality is a product of who your parents were and your genetics versus the community you grew up in. And so we're trying to do that kind of stuff here at the Morton Arboretum. And so my research here at the Arboretum, um, I kind of use three main tools and approaches. And so I study how climate has affected trees in the past using the tree rings like you see on your table. And in that, we're looking, I do a lot of looking at the influences of not just climate, but people. You know, in 1850, people started marching across the flatland and turning into farmland. And so trying to understand what impact that had on ecosystems. And as we burn our forests now, or as we do management, how does that impact how our trees grow? And we can learn a lot of that by looking at past trends in either historical records or tree rings. Um, another thing I do to study how trees respond to climate and weather in the present is using phenology. So I know some of my wonderful volunteers go out, they're here today, uh, they go out every week rain, snow or shine, uh, and they look at what the tree is doing. They track leaf out. They look for little oak flowers, which are really hard to see, um, but they're wonderful. And so by tracking that from year to year, we can understand how uh, the weather influences how a tree grows. Last year, it was super warm. Things were leafing out two, three weeks earlier than normal. This year, we're about average or maybe a little behind. And so what impact does that have for tree growth? And so we're looking at some of these modern dynamics in terms of how weather impacts trees. And then the third part of what I do is using uh, computer modeling. So I literally take the climate change scenarios that Dom was just talking about, and I put it with our best, uh, our best understanding of how trees grow using everything from those tree ring estimates to the physics of how uh, photosynthesis works, if you remember your middle school science. Um, and then we see, you know, what are these interactions? How will that, you know, increase precipitation overall, but less precipitation in the summer? What does that mean for our forests? And then we're also working on putting humans back into the picture as well and trying to understand, is that potential summer drought going to have a bigger impact on our long-term forest dynamics than, uh, you know, the fact that we decided to burn that piece of forest this year or that we want to harvest it so that my nephew can go to college? Um, and one thing about this is that while we're working on all this, the science moves faster than the trees, but not as fast as policy wants. And so unfortunately, science doesn't have all the answers, but we're doing what we can. And so we're trying to provide the best 
possible information so that you guys can act on it and governments can act on it and uh, so that we can move forward as the best we can. Yay. <laughs> So when you're thinking long term and you've got the the hundred year East Texas thing on your mind, what what pops into your head about the the trees here a hundred years from now? Oh man, it's really you know I think probably a lot of y'all also struggle with it. It's hard to reconcile a picture of East Texas with here, um, but we already see change happening rapidly in our forests, and so things like emerald ash borer that are removing certain species from our forests one by one. I grew up in Virginia, hemlock willy adelgid has killed the majority of hemlocks. And so those events really create opportunities for the forest to change. And I think it's using those opportunities and then thinking about you know, what is growing in West Texas that seems like it might do okay here. I think those are real opportunities. And so even though some of these pests and pathogens that are killing trees uh, seem devastating, from a forest point of view, it might actually be a real opportunity to facilitate change. There is a natural regeneration thing that happens in forests. Trees do die, sometimes in mass. And some trees really rely on that death of others to regenerate. Oaks, you hear the Arboretum talk about oaks a lot. Um, oaks really require a high sunlight environment to regenerate. And so it's really having some of these opportunities that will allow uh, species that we see on the landscape today to persist as well as facilitate the natural changing. And we want to make sure that we see a smooth transition of the forest into the future rather than emerald ash borer coming in and wiping out uh, you know, maybe a third of our trees. Cool. Uh, next we have Dr. Leslie Bryant. She is a climate change specialist with the Forest Service. She connects climate change research with forest management practices. She developed an ecosystem vulnerability assessment for Illinois, Indiana, and Missouri, and it's used to develop real world, world climate change adaptation strategies. And she's a coordinator of the Central Hardwoods and Urban Forestry Climate Change Response Framework Projects. And uh, uh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? What's the acronym for that? I can't even figure that out. Um, uh, there's a pilot initiative underway in the Chicago area with a goal to build on lessons learned to expand to other uh, urban areas in the region. Thanks for joining us, Leslie. Thanks for having me. So um, as, I, as um, Jerome mentioned, I'm with the U.S. Forest Service and I'm with a group called the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. And I'm also part of the USDA climate hub for our region. And so we're working on taking all of the great science that's coming from climate scientists and forest ecologists and um, management science and thinking about how to apply that um, to decisions that um, policymakers and on the ground forest managers make every day. And so my, my main role is to um, develop what we call um, vulnerability assessments. And these take um, into account the impacts of climate change for a particular location, um, model projections of how tree species might respond or ecosystems might respond to those changes, and then think about which species or ecosystems might be more or less vulnerable. And then we can make decisions about how we manage our land or manage individual trees based on what makes them vulnerable and which species might be more vulnerable or less vulnerable. It doesn't really tell you what to do, but it gives you a framework for thinking about it. Then we take that information and we also have developed a process for developing strategies for adaptation. And I've been working with, um, with Lydia here on some um, work here in the Chicago region to apply that framework to thinking about urban trees. And we have finished our pilot assessment for um, the Chicago region and we've been expanding that out um, to areas like Minneapolis, um, Cleveland, Ohio, Boston, Philadelphia, New York. And I'm actually going to be starting to work with people in Texas so maybe we'll know what we, we can expect in the future. So I'm going to share with you um, a brief slide showing some of the results of what we have found in their vulnerability assessment. So this is based on um, 
a tree census that was done in um, 2010 um, that was that helped provide a lot of information for the Chicago Region Trees Initiative that Lydia will be talking about. And we took that information and looked at um, projections of habitat suitability for native trees. We also looked at how hardiness zones and heat zones might shift in this area. And what I can say is that um, hardiness zones might change between one to two zones in some um, parts of this area. And so you might have a whole different palette of species that you're able to um, plant in your garden. But um, one caveat to that is there's a lot of uncertainty in those estimates. So if we have some really extreme winters, um, we might not be able to sustain some of those species. There's a lot of uncertainty in soils. And so we need to do on the ground research to figure out what is actually going to happen. Now, when you look on the right-hand side, what you'll see is that it looks like um, about half the species are have low vulnerability, or half the trees in the area have low vulnerability. But if you look at those little um, pie charts on the left, on the right side, what you'll see is that um, a lot of our least vulnerable species are invasive species. So European buckthorn is one of the most common trees in the Chicago region, and not surprisingly, it's not very vulnerable. It has, <laughs> it has a lot of capacity to adapt and disperse to new areas, and so it's going to, um, in the future, continue to thrive. Whereas some of our native trees, especially those that are um, more common north of this area, um, might experience some additional stresses. So this includes some of the species that we um, more commonly might see in places like Wisconsin. A lot of our conifer species are particularly vulnerable. Um, but then it can also include some of our um, um, more native oak trees as well. Um, there's some diseases like burr oak blight that there seems to be a relationship between increases in spring precipitation and this particular pathogen. So um, as we work to restore some of our ecosystems, we're going to be facing some additional challenges with pests and diseases as well. So what are the consequences to this? Um, to this? How, how might um, this affect our landscape? Well, in a lot of our urban areas, what we have done in the past is plant a lot of um, monocultures along our streets, where we'll have a row of we had a row of elm trees, and Dutch elm disease came through. And what did we do? We planted a bunch of ash trees. <laughs> so what we ended up with <laughs> is the emerald ash borer coming through, wiping out um, almost all of our ash trees. Um, this is a picture from the Twin Cities, where we had, we've just had rows and rows. This, hap this ha very thing happened on my very street. And um, we had. Um, just devastating loss in our in our ash canopies, and um, depending on which city you're in, you can have about um, you know 10 to 20 percent ash in a lot of our in a lot of our urban areas. And so, if we had thought about this better back in the day and planted a more diverse array of species on our streets, we wouldn't be seeing this. And people are finally starting to learn from our past mistakes. Um, and thinking about how we might adapt to this. So this is an example from Riverside, a suburb of um, the sh Chicago right, right here. And um, a um, forester for that, for that village came to some of our workshops to develop some adaptation strategies. And he started looking at projected um, habitat suitability for different tree species. And he was noticing a lot of the species that are more common to southern Illinois might become um, better adapted in this area. And so he's um, starting to try some of this out. And in addition to planting um, more southern species, he's also um, diversifying the um, species planting on individual streets. And also thinking about how do we ensure that those species and those individual trees are going to survive um, those first few years after planting. A lot of the mortality that happens in our urban trees is in the first few years. So if we water them, mulch them, make sure they're planted at the proper depth, are pruned properly, we give them a better um, chance of survival. 
So in this example here, I think we have um, Accolade Elm, which is a Dutch elm resistant cultivar. There's um, Buckeye and um, I forget, Pecan um, are some of the things he's trying out. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't continue and we shouldn't stop planting a lot of our native trees, but we're gonna have to start diversifying our portfolio, if you will, to make sure that we're resilient into the future. Yay. I'm, I'm a kind of lay person, and I don't often get onto the U.S. Forest Service website, <laughs> but I decided to nose around and look at your climate change stuff. It's prolific. It's unbelievable. There's, uh, you can sit there and watch conferences about every place, to Texas and California, and uh, all, you guys are on it and have been on it for a while. Um, what, um, when did you guys get like religion on this and really start going at it? It, it, it seems so thorough, and, and you're involved in urban forestry in a way that I had no idea. Well, that's a great question. So the Forest Service has been involved in research on understanding the impacts of climate change on forests for, for a number of decades. Um, in the, about the mid-2000s, um, our group was formed um, and started doing some educational outreach to our national forests, just spreading the word of what is the climate science tell us about what's going to happen to um, trees on our national forests. And some of the folks in leadership decided, you know what, we should start thinking about how to actually take this information and apply it into our decision making. So over the last um, decade or so, we've really built um, a program nationwide where we're um, assessing our vulnerability of our national forests as well as um, across all lands and then developing adaptation strategies. And so we're kind of past our first phase now and really getting to this next phase of how do we tell what's effective? How do we um, take what we've learned um, on our national forest and apply that to other areas? And um, the last couple of years, um, mainly through working with the Morton Arboretum, I've been able to expand that work into urban areas. So it's been great. It's been a great partnership here. I've been glad to work with these folks. Um, let's go on now to Matt Lobdell, and he's the head of collections and curator at the Morton Arboretum here. And he selects and evaluates plant species for cultivation across the grounds of the Arboretum, and he oversees the long-range planning of the Arboretum's collection, using it as a living gene bank, uh, cultivating endangered or rare species through uh, ex situ conservation. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I know it means taking trees from some other place and putting them in some other place. <laughs> All right, thank you for the introduction, and, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, as Jerome said, my name is Matt Lobdell. I'm the head of collections and curator here at the Morton Arboretum, which tasks me with the exciting job of overseeing the maintenance and the development of our world-class plant collections. We focus mostly on trees and shrubs here, which are my personal favorite. And when I, uh, when I talk a little bit about what I do with the Arboretum, particularly to some people who are outside of the region, I always start by saying, you know, Northern Illinois isn't the worst part of the world to grow plants in, but it's pretty close. <laughs> okay, right, we've got hot, humid summers, we've got bitter, cold winters, we have heavy alkaline clay soils, we've got winter winds, spring wetness, pretty windy in spring too, you know, if you look at today. The list goes on, right? But uh, with that in mind, as we look to the history of our institution, over the past 100 years, We've actually been pretty good at cultivating some plants in this area, and we have some surprising success stories. Here's the first photo I want to show you. Now, this, is, uh, this looks like the Arboretum's East Woods. I can't quite see from back here, but that's what I thought it was. Um, and when, whenever I think of the Morton Arboretum, I think of my first day here, which was October 20th, 2014. I got here in peak fall color. And for me, this was incredible, because I'd just been living in South Carolina and Delaware, and we don't have fall color like that in that part of the country. Um, what you tend to see for fall color, right, isn't this just gorgeous yellow or red or, or orange of the maples. You get something that's a lot more muted, that looks a lot more like this. This is actually still the Morton Arboretum in a bad fall color year. Um, <laughs> I got this from, from 2013, but if I had some photos of 2017, it would have looked a lot like this. 
And the reason is that last fall we had in 2017 was actually quite a lot what autumns look like in the South. You have this sort of long, warm fall, which is best time to visit the Southeast, if anybody asks, is that time of year the humidity drops. But it's not really great for the trees. And some of these, uh, well, it's not great for our trees. And the reason behind this is these trees, when you're having this sort of long, slow, warm fall, they're not getting the signal to shut down. Right, they don't know if that signal when the, uh, the chlorophyll is going to start to break down and you get to see those red and, and orange and, and yellow pigments. But more importantly, um, aside from the aesthetic problems, we also start to have a hardiness problem when we have autumns like that. The reason for this is because those trees are not getting that chance to kind of to harden off and fully go dormant. They're trying to keep growing. They're trying to get that last bit of energy they can. But when they get caught off guard, when it finally does get really cold, we can have trees that would normally be perfectly fine in a winter you get down to zero degrees or minus 10 or minus 20. But if they don't get that hardening off period, then they can be a lot more vulnerable at that time of year than they, than they normally would be. One more slide is the other transitional season, which is spring. Um, this is a Juglans mancherica, which is a, a Manchurian walnut, which is a species from Northeast Asia. And this is a region where what you tend to get for, uh, for springs there is these nice, slow, progressive springs. So it'll be 30 for a while, and then 40, and then 50, and eventually 60. I haven't been in Illinois that long. I don't know if we've ever quite had a spring like that. It seems to me it's a lot more like 30, 30, 50, 70, 40, 50, 30, 70, 70. Um, a lot of trees like this, they really don't deal with that sort of spring very well. The reason is because they get that signal to leaf out, to start producing leaves and to start you know, photosynthesizing and building energy. Then that late frost comes, which just knocks them right back. And uh, this is something that I think we'll probably see a little bit more of as climate change starts to reach the Arboretum, or as I'm gonna refer to it based on our, our panel discussion tonight, the drive to East Texas, <laughs> with the long road to East Texas. So what I'm, uh, what I'm also gonna talk about a little bit tonight is that was sort of what we're gonna see in, in the future, but, or what, what we'll see in the near future. I'd also like to talk about just what we're gonna do with the Arboretum to try to plan to plan to allow our collections to still remain viable and scientifically relevant and healthy for now and for generations long into the future. Um, Chrissy did a great job explaining the time frame of, um, of trees, so I won't go into too much detail about this, but um, one thing I, I do quite a bit is travel the country or travel the world trying to find new species and new trees for our plant collections. And the reason for this is I think a healthy collection is a diverse collection. And I've actually been to East Texas looking for, looking for trees, so I'm glad this came up. And people sometimes think I'm crazy going to the Southeast, especially when I started here. They'd be like, you know, I know you were living in South Carolina, but you know it gets cold here, right? Like, yes, I'm aware it gets cold in Northern Illinois. But there's the magnolia species, okay? Magnolia pyramidata, the pyramid magnolia, or Barton's magnolia. It, uh, despite growing in East Texas, the Gulf area, you know, Florida Panhandle, it's fully hardy here in our collections. We have one of them which is from you know, central Alabama, not quite East Texas, but equally you know, not Illinois. Um, <laughs> but it survived that really harsh winter we had in 2013 with no damage. So sometimes these plants can be a lot more resilient than we might think they are at first. So even though it might seem like that these plants might require very specific conditions, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they can form well outside of their native range than they might uh, previously. So as you think about how some of these native species or these real stalwart performers in our collections may be impacted as time goes on, I think the answer is to just try as many trees as we can. Um, I, could, I could list a long list of places I've been, but what we're looking at is just trying to, to get as many as we can to kind of hedge our bets to make sure that we have these healthy trees for future generations. I'm a little bit of a time frame. So an, an acorn I collect in Alabama in 2015. You know, by, 2016 it germinates, 2017, 2018 it's spending some time in a covered greenhouse. Maybe it spends the next three years in a plastic hoop house and pretty soon it's maybe 2025 by the time it's out in the nursery. Move it from the nursery into the ground, let it establish for another five years, it's 2030. And then by the time it really matures, fully establishes and starts producing acorns, it's 2060. And as we look at that time frame, I mean, we're, we're getting pretty close to East Texas then. Maybe we're in, we're in Oklahoma, depending on which way we go. But the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is 
You know, in addition to just making sure that we're keeping our collections diverse and relevant, there's actually some, some fairly exciting things I think we can do in our collections to try to keep tree species from going extinct. I talked about Pyrin magnolia. Another tree I want to talk about is the Georgia oak. This is a red-listed endangered oak species, and we've actually learned a little bit more about how endangered it is through some great work we've done here at the Morton Arboretum. It really grows in a few mountains in Georgia, Stone Mountain, Pine Mountain. I've seen it in a few places in Alabama. And you would think again that a tree that grows that far south would have no chance of growing here at the Arboretum. But it does, and it grows quite well. And if we're gonna be East Texas, I can't even imagine what Georgia's gonna be like. We might be at a point where we can grow this tree much better here in our Arboretum than they can grow, than they can grow in its native range now. So by holding it here and having a living gene bank, we wouldn't be able to save a species that could, over, that could go extinct otherwise. So now I don't wanna get excited about climate change, but as we think about the way our collections can be relevant, I think that's something that we can really do to help. So I'll leave you with one final, final word, and you know, I was about this earlier, but I feel like I've seen the future of trees, and the future of trees is diversity. Thank you. Hey. I don't know. I, I don't know what it's like growing up as, uh, as, you know, making a decision to go into your field, and, and you decided I'm going to be the guy who moves the trees around and I'm, I'm doing the exotic trees in places. And and now the whole field is coming to you for answers for climate change. Do you feel like did you did you know that the whole world was going to be coming to you for answers for climate change when you started? You think I got the market cornered here. <laughs> Uh, easy question. No. <laughs> Do you feel like it is coming to you, though, that, that, that there is, uh, like, uh, people are going to come to guys like you for answers now? Right, and I think that's, that's a good point. I mean, one thing that's exciting about being here at the Arboretum is we have such a history of growing some of these trees that we might be able to look at our, our past accession records and see some of the things that, that we've worked on or things that maybe were almost hardy or almost survived back in the 40s and back in the 50s. If you look at some of our really old literature at the Arboretum, we were recording just that. So maybe those things that almost worked really well here in the 50s will work well here in the 2050s. And uh, yeah, to Christy's point, I mean, it, the soil's not gonna change. So if we still have something that's alkaline tolerant, that can take those clay conditions, that can take that lack of drainage, um, then maybe that's something that, that would be very valuable to look at in the future. All right, uh, Matt uh, Labdell, thanks very much. Uh, next, we move on to Lydia Scott, director of the Chicago Region Trees Initiative here. It provides education and outreach to 150 communities across the seven-county Chicago region to improve the health, diversity, and canopy cover of this area's urban forest, and it has the largest collected uh, urban forestry data set in the country. Hooray for the Chicago Region uh, Trees Initiative. Yay. I was asked to talk a little bit about what the Arboretum is doing to help you and your communities uh, deal with these climate impacts and care for our trees. And one of the first things that, I've only been at the Arboretum for six years, and one of the first things that happened was that I was uh, given this project, and it was right after the Arboretum did the tree census, the 2010 tree census, that showed us that our trees were really in a major state of transition. And so they formed this collaboration with other leading organizations across the seven county Chicago region so that we can work together to improve the health of our urban forests and improve our quality of life for those of us that live here. Whoops, went too fast. So as Jerome mentioned, we know about your forest. We have one of the largest data sets and we think the largest data set on urban forestry in the country. And what we've done is we've spent a lot of time trying to get that information down to the level where we can sort it out by community. And so that's where it's really important that those of you that are here tonight think about what's going on in your community and how you can be involved where you live, on your property, and with your community to make trees healthier so that you can have a better quality of life. We've taken the data that we've collected and we put it into data sets that you can actually access on the chicagorti.org website that shows you what your community looks like, what your canopy looks like, and how you compare to other communities. And every few months, we increase the data that's in those data sets. Right now, we're inputting data on 
how much water those trees in your community are intercepting, how much air quality they're, or how much air pollution out of the air they're taking uh, for your community, and some other aspects that are related to some of the benefits that trees provide. And so it's really a great resource for you to go to first off, just to get a, a vision of what your community is like. When you think about community for us, the first thing I want you to think about is that your municipality is not the largest landowner of trees in your community. You as a resident are. 70% of the trees in the Chicago region are on your properties. They're on private land. And so we need to be reaching out to all of you individually, and we're doing that right now by going through your community trying to get to you. And so if you haven't heard about us or you aren't hearing about trees in your community, we want you to go talk to your municipality and let them know that we want to be involved. When we think about stress, and we talked a little bit about this, those of you that have gone through this flu season this last year, many of you may have gotten the flu and, and had uh, many problems with that, but we know when we're under stress, we're more susceptible to getting diseases and problems. And the same is true with our trees. And so when you go home and you look out in your backyard and you say, hmm, I wonder what species of tree that is, it would be good for you just to take a moment to try and figure that out. And we have some resources that can help you with that. But by knowing a little bit about the kind of tree you have, you'll have a better understanding about what growing conditions that tree needs to be growing in. So if your tree needs water during these prolonged droughts that we may be experiencing, or increased heat is probably going to need more water. Taking care to just walk outside and see if something looks unusual or strange in your backyard or on that tree, that's an important thing to know. And if you can't figure it out, we have a plant clinic here that is bar none one of the best around, so you'll be able to get some really great information from them. We also want to know about some unusual insects and pests you may be seeing in your backyard. Did you know that the Asian, or sorry, the emerald ash borer was found by an individual homeowner, just like you? They were the first ones to find it, and they didn't discover it until it had been here for six years or more. Emerald, our Asian longhorn beetle was an insect that was here in the 1990s and was found in Ravenswood by um, an individual, and they reported it, and we were able to eradicate it. Asian longhorn beetle is sitting out in Ohio right now waiting to come back into Illinois, and one of its favorite species is maple. So when we talk about species diversity, 32% of all the street trees in communities are maple trees. And when you're asking your landscaper, you're thinking about what tree you want to plant on your property, you want to be thinking about diversity, just as, as Matt was talking about. Instead of saying, I love that tree on my neighbor's property, I want one just like them, you say, I want to find a tree that has similar or qualities as that tree, but is different than that tree because we know that in one of the best ways that we can combat climate change is to have broad species diversity. I often get asked by people, what species of trees do you recommend? And I say, I recommend that you plant broad species diversity. I never get sucked into this issue of identifying for them um, what exact species they should be planting. Now let's talk a little bit about some other things that you can do. How many of you, and I wanna see by a raise of hands, how many of you have a municipal forester in your community? Okay, put your hand down. How many of you have no idea? Come on, be brave. All right. That's one of the first things you need to find out about your community. Do you have a forester on staff? And if not, why? It's not a big challenge to get a municipal arborist, a certified arborist on staff. It's, it's, and a lot of your folks actually have pretty good knowledge and pretty good skills that if they took just a little bit more effort, they could become a certified arborist. And it opens a, a, a wide range of, of qualifications and trainings for them through their professional association. The other thing is, how many of you have a tree preservation ordinance in your community? Anybody? Oh, we got a couple of hands. And the rest of you don't know, right? Okay, all right. If you don't have a tree preservation in your ordinance or in your community, that's something that you should have. We have templates that we've developed through the Chicago Region Trees Initiative that your community can just take and put the village of whatever, their name in there, and use that as a template to start with. And we have three different kinds of templates. So if you want to really be on the upper echelons and have a gold level ordinance, you can do that level, or you can start at the bronze level, but at least get started someplace. So what I'm saying to you is in order to combat climate change, you need to be working with your municipality so that they're able to help the trees in your community. 
and you as a homeowner need to be aware of what you have on your property and what you need to do to take care of it. So that's a picture of you out in front of your trees, smiling happily, <laughs> having a great time supporting the trees in your community. The, the Morton Arboretum has a wealth of resources available to you on the Morton Arboretum website. We as the Chicago Regent Trees Initiative as part of the Morton Arboretum have a resource section on our website site that has all of our partners information on it. So if you just come look with questions, we should be able to help you and answer some of those questions. We have folks on our staff through the Community Trees Program that will come out and work with your municipalities. We have folks on our staff that will come out and talk to your garden club, talk to your library program, and are glad to at any time talk with groups within your community to help you understand your urban forest better. Because in order for it to get through this, these impacts of a changing climate, we have to do something to care for that forest. So you've all been challenged. Next time we meet, next year, I want to see all those hands go up and saying you do know if you have an urban forester on your staff and if you know if you have a tree preservation ordinance. So thank you. Yay. So you, you have a, a canopy goal with uh, the initiative, and, and I mean the object is to grow more trees in cities so st cities stay cool, so our urban areas stay cool, and we, that would be a big help for climate change. That's right. We actually, um, right now the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, we're wrapping up our master plan planning process. And what we're recommending um, is that we plant two trees for every person between, the, between now and the next and 2050. So recognize that not everybody is going to be able to plant two trees for themselves. So if you plant four, six, eight, or 10, you're helping somebody else. But we do want to see, we want to see going from 20% canopy that we were in uh, 2010, we're now at 18% due to the loss of 13 million ash trees and we want to get to 22% by 2050. All right, that seems like a doable goal, doesn't it? I mean, we, I, I imagine there's a lot of lost trees, but like, uh, we should be able to do that. Well, that's our hope. We're going to be, we're, no, I shouldn't say hope, that we're going to do it, Jerome, we're going to do it. <laughs> Yay, more trees. Um, now, I wanted to ask a bunch of questions about what's really going on with trees and, and climate change and, and how they react to a changing climate. Um, what does something like a shorter winter do to a specific tree? Do, 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 when, when it's, if you've got an easy going winter and you're used to hard winters, does that, is that a bad thing or is that, do trees dig that? Um, so part of it is it's gonna depend on which tree you have. So in general, there are three things that control when your tree is gonna start forming leaves. Uh, one of them is temperature. And so for many trees, warmer winters cause trees to leaf out earlier. Um, but that's not the only thing that controls leaf out. There are some species that are controlled by daylight length. And so as, even though temperatures are getting warmer, we're not changing how we orbit around the sun. And so that day length is gonna stay constant. The other thing is the inverse of warm temperatures, it's coldness. And so it's that hardening off period and chilling period. And so if you live in California, you have to put your tulips in the fridge so that they get a cool period so that they can then flower. A lot of the trees we have around here, we don't think are reaching that edge of that chilling requirement. But I think there is some concern in Europe that trees are no longer getting that. And so the flip side of that is you might think, oh, earlier leaf out, the tree's gonna be able to grow for longer. However, even though the winters are getting warmer, that date of last frost isn't shifting in proportion. And so for many trees, particularly those that are most sensitive to temperature and leaf out the earliest, um, they're gonna be more vulnerable to that frost damage like uh, Matt talked about. But that isn't true for all trees. And so one thing we're doing here with our volunteers is trying to figure out which trees are the most sensitive to that temperature, which are gonna be most vulnerable to those last frost events, and which are gonna be okay because they're not as sensitive. They're relying more on some of those light cues. Do you have any front runners on the vulnerable? <laughs> Ask me again in three years. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Matt might know though. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I suppose as you, as you think about um, trees that are most vulnerable. I, I think what, uh, what Leslie said is what I, what I would agree with. Some of these that maybe were already out there, um, their southernmost distribution are probably the ones that I would be most concerned about. Um, uh, let's do the reverse and think about hot and what, what a really hot time is for a tree here and what it does. Um, you know, in reading about it, I was 
reading that um, it's not necessarily just a drought that kills trees, but just straight up heat can kill the tree. Uh, can you kind of go into that and explain what goes on with uh, too much hot? Yeah, so part of it is, so if you think about how a tree grows, a tree needs sunlight, it needs water, and then temperature kind of controls how fast it can uh, grow, how fast it can take carbon from the air and put it into wood. Um, in general, if we look at across temperate zones, warmer temperatures mean you can do more of the physics that allow a tree to grow to a point. Once you hit about 40 degrees Celsius, it ends up hitting a point where uh, you can't uh, grow as fast as you're losing water. And so it causes a tree to be more water stress, even if precipitation is okay. Another thing is that um, kind of like if you overcook your meat or you try to cook an egg too fast, you do have some uh, basic physics and chemistry if you end up having some enzymes degrade. And so uh, there is a potential for some of these temperature stresses to get decoupled from precipitation and moisture. Um, it's gonna have to get really hot for that though. Um, I don't think we're quite at those temperatures yet. Um, in general, it is really that, that interaction, but it looks like Don can say more about that. I was just gonna say that 40 degrees centigrade is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so, uh, so, it's, so it is extreme heat, but, uh, but we're gonna see more and more of that type of extreme heat over the coming decades. Um, now, I wanted to, to understand better what happens when our zones change and we end up with uh, different, in a different zone. Um, if we're gonna leap a couple zones, what, what does that mean for trees? Yeah, well, um, the underlying thing is a lot of the physiological and phenological things that Christy was bringing up. But um, how we think about um, what species or cultivars we might select at a garden center for planting, usually you look and you say, oh, it's hardy to zone four, I can plant it here in my yard. And so there might be some additional things that we might be able to plant that we hadn't been able to plant before. But there might be other things where on the flip side, so if you look at um, hardiness um, on the flip side, there might be some that you don't have that cold hardening anymore and you can't plant it anymore. There might be some um, species that um, the heat zone is higher um, than it can tolerate. And that's based on the number of days above um, 30 degrees um, um, Celsius, I think, is how heat zones are determined. And I'm not quite sure why they use that temperature threshold. Um, but that's what they do. <laughs> um, but um, so for a lot of species, um, it, as you get those higher s summer temperatures, they might no, no longer be able to um, tolerate those temperatures. And I think another thing to think about with heat is um, as your tree gets more stressed, it opens it up to a lot of additional um, um, pests and pathogens. Um, and some of those um, pests, a lot of those insect pests, might be able to have additional generations um, or survive longer or things that might not have been able to survive winters or being able to move into this area. So in addition to those direct physiological effects on our trees, we also have these secondary effects um, of pests and pathogens that are likely to have a pretty dramatic effect on our trees. If we were to state what trees look like winners and losers right now in the climate change derby, uh, could you tick off a few? Well, um, we have looked at model projections for this area, and some generalizations that we can make are some of our more northern trees are generally expected to be losers. Um, so a lot of our like northern conifer species, so things like um, pines and spruce that might be more common if you go up to Door County, for example, in the summer and see those. Some people plant them in their yard. They're here. They're probably on the grounds here. And um, a lot of those species are just not adapted to really high temperatures. Um, on the winter side, um, that's harder to tell 
because um, there are a lot of unknowns there. But generally, what we expect is that a lot of the trees that are on the northern end, edge of their range or the center of their range here are more likely to um, be um, more resilient to a lot of the fluctuations in temperature and precipitation that we're seeing. We also think because um, we're going to have more summer dry events, we might want to be looking a little bit to the, to the west of here. So if you look at um, places like Missouri or Arkansas and eventually Texas, um, those might be some of our potential winners in the future. But at, at what time point they will be is, is a little trickier. Um, so that's, that's something that um, there are still a lot of unknowns. I was reading that beaches might be, I mean, beaches seem to be winning for multiple reasons, but uh, are beach trees winners? Um, I don't, not necessarily know. Um, I mean, they require a pretty um, high amount of precipitation, and they are kind of on the western edge of their range here. Um, so the beaches are one where um, the, temp the temperature might be OK, but precipitation might be a factor that might make them more stressed. What about sugar maples as losers? Yes, um, we are actually seeing that in um, Minnesota. I don't know if you're seeing that here, where we're having some problems with sugar maple decline. Um, and they think that that might be um, related to some um, temperature effects. Around here, though, a lot of our story about sugar maple is really where we start getting into interactions between people and climate. Um, because here at the Arboretum, if you go out to certain parts, it's covered in sugar maple when, according to our best knowledge, it should be you know, a couple maples and more oaks. And part of that's because of fire. And so a lot of this is trying to figure out how people and our management fit in. Because even though in terms of climate, in theory, it should be coming less hospitable for sugar maple, because we've uh, changed the historical burn regimes, and oaks really like fire and disturbance to create those open environments, um, we kind of have this, this contrasting thing. So climate is becoming less hospitable, but unless we change some of our management, um, it's becoming more hospitable. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think with the increase in precipitation that we've seen more recently, um, there was a recent paper by um, some researchers out of Purdue, which has shown a sort of westward shift in some of the um, species, and um, maples seem to be moving west, and they think it might be somewhat related to this increase in precipitation. So Lydia, when it comes to street, people love the maples as street trees. We're, they're all over the place. Do, do you counsel people to kind of maybe lay off some of these maples? That are yes, we do. We, um, I, we get a little pushback from the nurseries on that because many of them have still have maples. a lot of nurseries in their stock, or maples in their stock. But yeah, we do. We recommend that they um, set back from planting maples for at least a few years and move on to some other species that may have broader uh, species diversity. But for instance, many of them will say, well, we love the, the fall color. Well, we have other trees that we can plant that will provide fall color. One that's becoming more popular here and is a more southern species is sweet gum that has just beautiful, beautiful fall color. Um, one of the little uh, elm cultivars, uh, the frontier elm, has red leaves into fall, too. So there's, I mean, there's many. And if you go to the tree selector tool on the Arboretum's website, you can put in fall color and some of the specifications that you want. And it'll give you some other species to choose from so you don't have to just select maples. All right, I'm dying to talk about pests. Um, <laughs> I, as a regular lay guy who um, you know, knows that there are these bark beetles that are eating all the trees in, in, the, in the West, I never really read the statistics or anything. But in doing so, I was, you know, really shocked. In the 2000s, more than 150,000 square miles of lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine forests in the United States and the Canadian Rockies died in just a few infestations. That's a, it's like a tree genocide, right? And uh, this is all, this is like, the bark beetle is a straight up climate change story. It is nothing else, right? It, that is all that's there. <laughs> Unfortunately, when talking about pests or really anything with trees, it's rarely just one thing. Um, because obviously the pest had to get there from somewhere. Um, one of the reasons that it, you know, the, the, these pests are able to really wipe things 
Northwest, the lodgepole pine and the spruces, they grow in pretty much monocultures. So if you're out hiking through Arizona, Colorado, it's all one tree, which is what really allows it to spread quickly. Um, climate change can facilitate that, um, but it's, it's really just one thing. And that's one of the big reasons why we do preach diversity. Um, out west, because it is a harsher climate, they are able to naturally support a little less diversity. But we don't have to necessarily uh, follow that same story. Because even though Matt thinks that it's pretty terrible to grow trees here, um, it's a whole lot better than Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like the, from the Beatles' point of view, it's warmer, and then that, that I get what I want. And I can, um, I can breed for longer. And it's, uh, the, there's no cold coming, and it's not killing me, so I can keep moving my territory. And this is, uh, that is just the whole story of that, that beetles. And, it, and it's supposed to be the most massive insect infestation ever in recorded history, this beetle just popping up all over Canada and all over the rest. I don't know what you want us to say. I know. <laughs> it's, I, it's bad, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't think people appreciate it. It's, yeah, especially and, here in the Midwest, it's just I, like yeah, stunning. And so, um, yeah, it is, it's a story of how um, I think a lot of different factors, um, man, past management regime, um, changes in um, climate, um, the ecology of those ecosystems, all of those things coming together can have a dramatic effect on the environment. Um, here, I mean, we've experienced um, a similar type of really dramatic impact with uh, um, emerald ash borer. Um, in the south, they have a native um, a pine beetle, southern pine beetle, and that's one that also seems to be benefiting from warmer climate. And so Connecticut recently found southern pine beetle, and they're pretty sure that there's some climate connection there. So milder temperatures had allowed that pest that normally was only attacking southern pines to move up um, into um, New England. Um, we haven't seen southern pine beetle in this part of um, the state yet, but um, it does attack um, shortleaf pine and some of the other pines that are common in the um, southern part of the state and, and just, just south of our border. Um, so if there are ways that it can get here and the winters are mild enough, and um, that's something that we could begin to worry about here um, that has a climate connection. One thing that I'd like to just add to that is that because Chicago is this big transportation hub, that we're going to see um, people bringing insects in with them or transporting them through pallets and other things. There's this big campaign that's been going on in the United States for some time, and many of you have, may have heard about it. It's don't move firewood. And as we watched the emerald ash borer move into Colorado, we know it went in a pile of, of firewood. So as we think about climate impacts and the susceptibility of our trees to uh, new invaders, it's really critical that we think about and keep our eyes peeled for potential new impacts or challenges with our trees so they can be eradicated or controlled as quickly and, and easily as possible. Uh, when it comes to the southern uh, pine beetle, I was reading a statistic about climate and the New England climate, and the New England climate is up a degree uh, recently, but the overnight cold climate, the, the lowest cold is up seven degrees, and that's why they think the beetle comes, right? So, I mean, that's like the variability of the climate thing, Don, is, is crazy. It's, it's overnight cold climate that we don't even think about. It, you know, we particularly have seen the warming occur at night over, throughout most of the country. Uh, in part, that's because during the daytime, um, a lot of particles we have in the atmosphere reflect sunlight, and uh, like sulfur dioxide emitted from coal burning becomes sulfuric aerosols in the atmosphere, and there's reflect sunlight. Well, at night, they don't have any effect, so you get the warming effect really appearing at nighttime. Yeah, I think that's really counterintuitive. I don't really think about that, but it's working out great for the beetles. And, and, and like this beetle thing, it's, it's not just here, it's in Africa. They've got some kind of aggressive beetles in Africa. And 
Switzerland has like uh, what? They, they're losing their spruce trees or something. Um, it's there's all sorts of people having these kind of problems. Um, well, if, if I did read that there is a way to manage these forests. Like people in the south, they go in and they thin the healthy woods of the weak trees. Can you get in there and? say, hey, uh, you know, if, if I've got some lousy, weak, vulnerable pines and I don't want this beetle coming, can you go in there and mow those pines down and, and boost up your, your, your power? Um, yeah, so that's something in the Forest Service. Obviously, we're, we um, think a lot about um, active forest management and how we can um, manage our forests to both um, provide um, the ecosystem services we like and also reduce um, our stressors to things like pests. And so that's a lot of why we're going in and managing our forests. It's not that we want to cut down a bunch of trees. We really want to make sure that we have a healthy, resilient forest. And a, a good way we can do that is um, is um, silviculture. Um, and actually, a project that's um, getting underway across our country that um, I'm somewhat involved in is um, this adaptive silviculture for climate change project. And we have set up um, experiments across the country where we're um, taking these different forest management strategies and thinking about how we can manage our forests to ensure that they're going to continue to provide the services that we love from our forests into the future. Um, so that's uh, something that will be really interesting to see over time. And one of the uh, other things about uh, you know, trying to look at a, a kind of a bright side on this is the trees that survive. There are like pine trees in the West that survived and people now study them to figure out if they are some kind of super tree, because this is normally what happens with beetles is they weed out the weak ones and you get the strong ones. And that's part of the, the whole thing. Uh, so there might be some kind of super trees left that can help sustain us in the, in the future if they don't get caught in a forest fire, which we're having way too many in the West right. as well. I mean, that said, there's lots of examples of that, not just out West. Um, a bit further East, we lost a lot of our chestnuts. And so there are organizations like the American Chestnut Foundation that go out and try to find these super trees. And, I, and you know, Matt probably knows more about the breeding here, but part of how we create the trees, like the Accolade Elm, is by finding those super trees, those naturally resistant trees, and trying to breed them. Yeah, right. I guess you could say the, the bright side of having a, a mass tree genocide is the survivors that you have makes it pretty easy to find what your, what your breeding parents should be or, or where you should start from there. Um, you know, to go back to the fire thing, uh, the, I've been reading that like the more since we have these kind of vulnerable woody things, uh, the fires are so hot the, the, that we're having that it's making regeneration of the forest uh, harder and maybe impossible. I, I read a quote from the head of the U.S. Geological Survey, Craig Allen, and he referred to a, a future world where uh, you can't regenerate forests as some sort of weed world, and the um, it would be unfamiliar to modern civilizations, uh, the kind of future that could come like if the forests get wiped out and they can't grow trees back, and you get a bunch of weedy invasives and grasses and odd stuff. Is that is that real? <laughs> well, I think I think that's why we feel that adaptation is so important because if we don't go in and um, manage our our forests um, for the future that is one potential consequence, is that we can have some disturbance that's so devastating that that system is no longer able to bounce back to its previous condition. And so we really need to think about um, what we can anticipate into the future and try to make sure that we maintain our ecosystem functioning over time. Yeah, and one thing to note is that that scenario is true in the West, where the lack of fire has caused um, kind of a buildup of trees that then become fuel. Um, it's a bit different here in Illinois, um, partially because we don't have these large swaths of natural or national forests like they do out West. Um, instead, you know, your yard is kind of in between. 
Um, so it's, it's a lot harder for the fire to spread. But then that also goes back to this maple idea, where the, the characteristics of maple leaves do not uh, are such that they don't promote fire like the uh, fall of pine needles. And so what we have around here isn't uh, leading to these super fires. Um, but we also don't have multi years of drought, such as the West is facing. And so with the, the warmer temperatures, the extremely dry soils, uh, the, the lack of precipitation, uh, the insect effects, it just leads to a natural condition where you get uh, wildfires can be much, much more dangerous. And are there places where it uh, is going to be better for trees, where there's going to be more rain and things are going to, uh, trees are going to prosper because they've got the more precipitation and they're, they're really enjoying it? Well, I guess um, if you look into Canada, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we're seeing sort of that tree line move move northward um, as things become milder or into Alaska. Um, so right here, we're at the prairie forest border. And so one of the concerns is that if we get hot and dry enough, it's really um, the climate's going to really support a prairie ecosystem more than a forested ecosystem. And so where you might end up only getting your forest is along rivers or in other little pockets where you have higher soil moisture. And in those areas where you have drier soils, you might actually see a transition to prairie. OK, I can take prairie. Um, I, I think it, now I get back to Matt's line of work. And like if we're re-engineering our landscape, um, are people excited about that? Or do people say, well, you're, you're the guy who eventually brings us invasive species or something? Because I, I, one man's new tree is another man's something else, I imagine. Uh, well, how does that work? How, what do you think about it? Right. So I think whenever we do talk about plant introduction and, and sort of moving plants outside of their native habitat, I think the, the idea of a, an invasive species does need to be discussed. And, the way I look at these things is, you know, maybe I'm in a foreign country, I bring back 100 plants. I might have 80 that do really well at the Arboretum. Well, actually, I hope so. Um, really, what might happen to a lot of these is they might just, like, never thrive at all. And maybe we do have that one that becomes a little bit problematic or becomes a little bit more invasive. Um, a few things I'll say is I think sometimes we get really engineered to think of plants as being so perfectly adapted to their ecological niche that they can't do anything outside of it. But as I talked a little about with some of those, those really rare species down in the southeast, I mean, some of these, despite that they seem to be found in, uh, in Georgia in these very specific habitats, they can sometimes do quite well elsewhere, too. Um, the, uh, what one of my old advisors would say, if I, if I remember it right, is plants occur in the wild where they compete best, not where they grow best. Right? If, that was, if that was the case, if they just only occurred where they grew best, we'd have no invasive species and we'd have no real success stories either. So when we talk about um, invasive species, I like to think that uh, you know, it's something we do need to be aware of, but I'd much rather have that be a problem here where maybe something gets a little bit out of hand and we're able to, to kind of deal with that outbreak of it before it becomes a spontaneous population and before it becomes spread throughout the nursery industry throughout the entire country. But I think um, if we are going to stay relevant as we look in the future in terms of you know, horticulture and maintained landscapes, I think we do need to keep in mind that the plants of today are not necessarily going to be the plants of tomorrow. Uh, I want to go to questions pretty soon here. So I know there's some monitors out there, and they're, they're grabbing questions and are going to bring them up to me. But I want to end on some hopeful things, some ideas about trees that are hopeful. Um, the, do you, after having worked with trees, do you have some um, encouragement from their genetic diversity capabilities, just their genetic makeup? They seem to have made it this far. They seem to know a thing or two. Are trees uh, you know, a little smarter than we think inside? I mean, I think trees, because they are long-lived and they can't move, they inherently have to be able to put up with a lot of crap. Um, the tree that, you know, that white oak core you have there, it lived through the Dust Bowl, which was pretty extreme. Um, so they, they can deal with a lot. 
Um, and there is an incredible amount of diversity in trees, um, not just when we're looking at the species and comparing uh, bur oaks here in Illinois to bur oaks in East Texas, um, but also from individual to individual. I have a colleague that's writing a paper called Your Tree is Weird, because <laughs> Each tree does its idiosyncratic thing. So there are these different layers of diversity um, that I think that tr make trees very resilient. I was reading something um, that was a study by the uh, National Academy of Science, and they said that better land stewardship is uh, something that could have a bigger role in fighting climate change than maybe previously thought. And they say that the estimates for nature's potential led by planting forests were up to 30% higher than those envisioned by the UN climate scientists report. Um, they think that we can, we can win. They think better land management is the key to winning. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with that particular report. Um, I do know that um, a lot of um, our, so our forests in our country help offset a pretty sizable amount of our emissions. I think it's like 10 to 20 percent, something like that. And um, but there's a lot of potential um, in other parts of the world to um, reforest or aforest areas that are not currently forested, and that could have a pretty dramatic effect. Um, on the amount of carbon sequestration that we have across the globe. Um, here in the U.S., um, I, there's, a, there's a limit to how much we can do. Um, one of the things we can do is try to keep forests as forests, so um, not convert forested land to other land uses. Um, and uh, there are some other potential to, um, to manage our forests in a way that um, can um, have higher carbon density, but that is difficult because you might also be um, opening yourself up to other risks like pests and diseases. I think another big opportunity, and Lydia can certainly speak to this a lot more, is the urban forest. In a lot of our assessments of carbon, um, a lot of times they say, oh, that's a city, and they mask it out. Um, so I was in Boston, and they found out when they you know, start to incorporate those street trees, there's a whole lot more carbon, and I think there's a lot of potential in our urban areas, and not just our natural. Okay, I'm ready for questions, you guys. Come on over here, you got an arm full of stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, shouldn't we consider migratory birds, butterflies, et cetera, when choosing what trees to plant more often than their appearance? All right. That, that's really true for us in the Chicago region um, because we know that the migratory birds pass through our area and stop here to get something to eat before flying across um, the lake to the as to their end destination, and we know that they uh, that our native species here have co-evolved with the insects that those birds rely on, and they know to stop here to get those. So it is important that we incorporate those native species into our planting pellets. And as we work on the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan, which is an effort that we have underway, we'll be relying on backyards and streets to help make these corridors and these pathways for these native species to uh, rely on. But again, you also want to take into account the changing climate because that's also <laughs> affecting the migratory birds. It's affecting what insects are going to be there. Uh, and when uh, the life cycle of, of various insects as well. Uh, you know, one, one of the things one of my friends who's a bird expert talks about is that, you know, it won't be many more decades before the Baltimore Oriole will never be seen in Baltimore. Um, and when we kind of uh, combine that, one of the next questions is about the um, planting non-native species in this area from Texas. We don't get the bugs, we don't get the insects, we don't get the birds. We, uh, we, that, that would be bad news for the broader environment. Yeah, I, I should add though, that it doesn't mean we're gonna be exactly like <laughs> East Texas. Uh, we're still gonna have snow, for example. When we did these analyses for Chicago, and we were asked that very question, oh, it's gonna be more like Texas. Well, it could be nice, you know, I like going to Texas for the winter, right? But, but you know, we're talking about extreme heat in the summer, but we're also talking about still having snow in the winter, maybe less snow than we have now, but there will be some snow and there will be some cold days. 
Here's a question about soil. How does soil respond to climate change? Does it change anything in the microbes? Uh, uh, all those little critters that are living in there, uh, do those things affect the trees? Yes. <laughs> So um, there's a lot of active research that has been looking at the effects of warming on um, carbon cycling in soils and, um, and the, how it shifts the microbial communities in soils. Um, we don't know nearly as much as we would like to know about what's going on underground. But we do know that there's going to be um, some dramatic effects and shifts in microbial communities, shifts in respiration, soil respiration rates, um, shifts in um, soil organic matter. And we don't, I mean, I, I have been in the room with a bunch of soil scientists arguing about this, and we just don't really know very much. Um, so and enzymes secreted by microbes are very temperature dependent. So we expect that that's going to affect um, a lot of the um, um, availability of nutrients, um, the amount, the rate of cycling of a lot of our nutrients, um, and that will definitely affect um, our trees um, because they rely on those microbes to recycle those nutrients. <laughs> Here's a question um, that is up Lydia's alley. Uh, what efforts are being uh, made to share the collective knowledge of the panelists with private landscapers and nurseries is um, you talked earlier about some of the policies you're trying to put in place uh, on a on a community level. Um, what do do private are are they um, a force for good or a force for evil out there? <laughs> Uh, we are working very collaboratively with the uh, nurseries. Uh, the Illinois Green Industry Association is one of our lead partners. We actually just had a roundtable with 60 nurseries in the last um, six weeks or so, I believe it was, uh, talking to them about expanding species, di species diversity. One of their concerns is that, that if they take the risk of expanding species diversity, will people come and buy those trees? And so they're very worried about expanding it out without knowing that there are resources available to help offset some of their risks, which you could well understand. What we're doing now is we're working with communities to encourage them to do contract growing, which means that they purchase in advance the species that they want and they take delivery on those trees in about five years time. And that reduces the risk for the nurseries and increases availability for the communities. Is it those maple trees they want to keep growing? <laughs> They're not happy about that. Um, here we go. Oh, there's flying. Um, that one, that is also a nursery question we've kind of addressed. Um, what is native to Illinois might not be so. How do um, we uh, People have got to do better handwriting. <laughs> uh, uh, native, something about natives. Do we still choose oaks and hickories as canopies? Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I get the question. Um, I, I think that uh, so o oaks and hickories are um, native to Illinois. Um, they're native to um, both northern and southern Illinois, and a lot of them go into. Um, places south of here as well and west of here as well. So um, some of the more northern oak species and hic northern hickory species might become a little bit more stressed, but there are a lot of other alternatives that are, are found in the central and southern parts of the state that might um, be um, potential replacements. Um, and so overall, um, what the general consensus is among a lot of forest ecologists is that the oak hickory forest um, in the central hardwoods region, which is um, more, so more south of here, um, will continue to thrive. And it's just the exact species composition that um, might shift slightly. I've got a couple of questions about the uh, tree ordinance, the tree protection ordinance. One of them just wants more details on what it what it um, what the ordinance does, and the other one um, is how do we persuade towns to 
to strengthen these tree protect these ordinances that they have. Um, right. These are the tree preser your your model uh, ordinance, which people can see on the website. It's really detailed. Mm, no, I mean if you look at a municipal ordinance, they're they're designed by lawyers, so by virtue of that, they're detailed. <laughs> um, and we've worked with a municipal law firm to help us develop those templates. So they're not as detailed as some other sections of, of the municipal code are. But what the tree preservation ordinance does is it specifies that trees that are owned by the municipality, and that this is if you're regulating public property trees, that if they're damaged or removed or, you know, say you as a homeowner decide you don't want that street tree out in front of your house and you cut it down, there may be some repercussions for you by virtue of you cutting down the municipal street tree, even though it's located outside the front of your house. So it, it sets up some criteria such as that. It also specifies that you will have um, certain specifications within your community where the trees will be maintained to, uh, by a, a professional arborist. You don't have to put that in there. Our templates are just advisory. Um, it would identify that trees be planted correctly so that when your tax dollars are used to play, plant trees across your community, that you know they're being planted correctly so they have a chance to live longer. So it just goes through some simple, um, clear explanations of what you should have in your municipality to protect that resource that you own and, and take care of. Uh, one of the uh, questions about the ordinance asks about homeowners clearing their properties and building you know, super mega houses and uh, they build right up to the lot line and there's no room for trees or, or gardening. Well, those vary based on the community. Our gold level ordinance template regulates trees on private property, which can be pro or con depending on your position on that. Um, uh, I came from a background of where I worked in a municipality where we did have a private property tree ordinance um, and Mr. T had cut down a significant number of trees in the community nearby. Uh, which precipitated that. We know that only about 15 to 20 communities in the Chicago region have a private property tree ordinance. And that's not to say that you have to have that as your standard. There are other practices that you can incorporate to help reduce those impacts by having a development ordinance that says your setbacks have to be so far, um, so many feet back, and you have to have so many trees um, on your property in order to offset some of the impacts that that, that building will take place uh, or will precipitate for you. Is there anything we can do to improve soil for our trees? And maybe we should say something about watering too since watering has kind of got to happen, I guess. So, I mean, I can speak a little bit about some of our history at the, at the Arboretum in terms of soil improvement. Um, we had a collection here for a long time called the Plants of Acid Soils Collection. Right. But we talked a little bit about how we have alkaline clay soils for the most part across the Arboretum. And we were able to do this. We were able to have a nice rhododendron and azalea collection, but it required a lot of effort on our part to lower that pH and give those plants the proper conditions. We found as soon as we stopped using those soil amendments, you know, give or take about five, ten years, the soils just returned to, to normal. So there are some things we can do kind of on like a micro level to, to improve soils, but I mean, I, I kind of take the approach that it's probably better to find the right plant for the right place as opposed to trying to change the place, unless there's um, you know, something on a more macro level that I'm not. I, I guess another thing is just trying to um, improve soil organic matter. Um, so soil organic matter can help retain a lot of moisture. It can also provide nutrients. Um, help sequester carbon. Um, so anything that you can do to um, maintain that um, litter layer, um, there are things you can do in your in your yard to also increase the amount of of uh, biomass that stays on your property. Um, using compost in your backyard is is a good thing. Um, so I don't know if you want to add to that at all. You see. <laughs> Soils is not my specialty. I just know what I've learned from my colleagues. Um, so a lot of it is, yeah, adding a soil organic matter. Another one that I've learned since being here is um, avoiding compaction. So when they uh, build that mega house, they're running bulldozers over it, and that makes the dirt apparently harder than concrete. Um, so doing things that can minimize that physical 
trampling of the dirt before you plant will help provide lots of opportunities for the roots to grow out so that they can get water, so they can get nutrients. Otherwise, a lot of times what happens is uh, you make this nice soil in a nice little hole, um, but trees don't like to stay in their nice little holes. But unless you give it the opportunity, there's nowhere for it to go. Um, so also avoiding compaction. Um, there is a question that kind of asks, you know, whether than planting two trees myself, what are some of the actions I could take to, to counter climate change? And um, we got to drop our carbon output and get better results is, is like the bottom line here. I mean, down the variables on, on the climate um, spectrum are, are really bad if we keep doing what we do and better if we, we put less carbon out. Yeah, that was the point of showing multiple scenarios, uh, was um, following the pathway we're on now, which is heavily using fossil fuels, uh, means, you know, 8 to 10 degree Fahrenheit by the end of the century. But if we choose to go a different pathway, or we put out much less carbon, uh, you know, we can be down to 2, 3, 4 degree um, in, the, in the end of the century. And, uh, we just have to really want it bad enough to make that happen. Um, how do trees survive in weather like we've had lately where temperatures keep fluctuating from sub-freezing to warm? Um, I think a lot of times they hedge their bets. Um, so luckily we haven't had too many really warm or prolonged warm spells. Um, so a lot of trees uh, tend to be kind of conservative in when they uh, do their life cycles, particularly in temperate areas like Illinois, where you have normal weather regimes of let's roll the dice and see what happens today. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of them do kind of, they are conservative. Uh, forests tend to green from the bottom up. And so things that are close to the ground, because the ground holds a lot of heat, so those spring ephemerals come out first because the ground kind of helps insulate them a little bit. And so a lot of the trees don't come out until, um, you know, maybe early April, or sorry, May, uh, mid-May or later. So a lot of them do try, particularly tall trees, uh, they do should be a little conservative in when they perform their life history events. How many individual tree specimens represent a good genetic base of diversity for any given species? Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, uh, my understanding of it is it's, it's different from species to species. It depends quite a bit on the, the overall distribution of the species. So something like bur oak, which is you know, all the way from Illinois over to Iowa, down to Texas, and all the way out to most of the East Coast, is probably going to have more diversity in some of those populations than maybe something like one of those really rare oaks I was talking about where, where the genetics are so kind of constrained because there's so few individuals left. So if populations, the number of trees, and just their, their geographic distribution is, um, is important to answering that question. Um, I wonder if you guys have, uh, well, we should probably wind up pretty soon here, but the, um, the whole idea that trees are going to um, save us from climate change. I mean, it sounds like trees can do a lot to mitigate climate change, but we can't get trees to eat all the carbon that we're putting out. Is that, the, is that about the size of it? And then, I mean, the UN is devoting billions of dollars to, to you know, in the climate uh, change regimen to, to planting trees and to, you know, doing the best they can. And there's, an, uh, there's people all over the planet trying to plant more trees that Chinese Red Army has got 40,000 guys out planting trees, and um, it's going to help. But I, you know, we got to drop more carbon ultimately, right? We certainly do. Uh, tree uh, reforestation can help a lot, but it, it's not going to. It, it is not the the end of the problem, it, but it can certainly help. Um, does anybody have an optimistic note to end on? Is anybody have anything really fun? <laughs> Lydia, I, I, Lydia, you got one. Come on. I mean, I think I think the optimistic note is that we all have a role in dealing with climate change, and we can help our trees so that they can help us. But we can also help um, our trees by reducing the amount of driving we do, or reducing. 
uh, the amount of heat that we use in our homes or air conditioning in the summer. And keep in mind that that big tree that's next to your house that you complain about raking those leaves up in the spring or the fall of the year is reducing those energy costs. So we need to be protecting and preserving those trees. Yay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for taking interest in trees and in, in our environment. And thank you, Morton Arboretum, for making this possible. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>